Professor Kamila Naidu, Executive Dean, Faculty of Humanities, Professor Tanusha Raniga, our inductee this evening, Professor Vijan T. Sopal, our respondent, and Emeritus Professor at the University of KwaZulu-Natal here in South Africa, and Professor at the University of Stavanger in Norway, senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics, online audience on Facebook and YouTube, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Sani Wonani, Huyenant, good evening, Tover. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Tanusha Raniga. As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome to her loved ones, special guests, and her colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful yet landmark moment for all of you, for Tanusha, and of course, for us here at UJ, higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the vice chancellor functionary and deliver their inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Traditionally, in Isikosa we say, Ukutweswa Isidanga, Kwisigaba, Sobujinga, Loazi. This loosely translated refers to assuming the role of the professor. Of course, in colonial traditions subscribed to by universities, this refers to the gown and the cap. The wise one would accept a blanket, ingubo. Once we have listened to the inaugural address, the gown or ingubo denoting the professorship will be formally assumed. We gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Raniga to the illustrious community of scholars to, uh, at the University of Johannesburg. It is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors provide a university with its identity, character, academic legitimacy, and integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. This evening, we will listen to Professor Raniga as the gown goes to town. By this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberates with society. It stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat Humboldt, referred to the university as a whole community of scholars and students engaged in a common search for truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, university have, universities have been viewed as instrumentalists serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to the public good. Edward said in an article on defiance of taking positions offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual as age of the person's discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation, the intellectual who considered, considers it necessary to step into the public sphere and to speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it to step out of the boundaries of the academy, to connect oneself, to, oneself, to affili affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process 
or contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed, the intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden and to provide alternatives for mistaken policies, close quote. It remains then for us as a university with a pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectual and as professors. How do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be flagship carriers of our disciplines? This evening, we will listen to Professor Raniga as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflected pause in the journey of the professor with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the discipline. Let me now invite the Executive Dean, Professor Kamala Naidu, to introduce Professor Raniga. I thank you. Kia lebocha. Sia bonga. Paya danki. Professor Mpedi, Professor Siupol, members of the Raniga family, and distinguished guests. It gives me great pleasure to read out the narrative CV of Professor Tanusha Raniga. Tanusha Raniga was born and raised in Durban, KwaZulu-Natal. She completed a high school at Wittercliff Secondary in Chatsworth. She completed a Bachelor of Social Work and Master's degree in Social Work at the ex-University of Natal. In 2007, she graduated with a PhD under the supervision of Professor Vishanti Supal, and a study was titled, The Implementation of the National Life Skills and HIV AIDS School Policy and Program in the Ithiquini region at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. In the post-1994 era, the debates on the relevance of the developmental approach to welfare motivated Tanusha to embark on several research projects which investigated the challenges of poverty and HIV and AIDS in poor households in KwaZulu-Natal. During her employment as an academic at UKZN, her field research conducted in the Urban Renewal Program in Inanda, north of Durban, contributed significantly to the implementation of women-led economic development cooperatives as a key poverty alleviation strategy in the Bombay community. Professor Raniga maintains that effective social work services and the development of transformative interventions must be based on empirical evidence that is African-centered and critically reflexive and that contributes to global and local understandings of the feminization of poverty in all its manifestations. Throughout her academic career, she has been guided by the philosophy that there must be awareness in the mind love in the heart, and righteousness in action. Her transition to the University of Johannesburg as Associate Professor in the Department of Social Work and Community Development in June 2017 has been a self-empowering journey with balancing responsibilities of teaching, conducting research, and engaging in communities. In 2013, she was the recipient of the National Young Up-and-Coming Academic Award of the Association of South African Social Work Education Institutions, ASASUE. Uh, she has made a valuable contribution to theory building and the development of empirically tested interventions across the disciplines of social work and community development. One of the highlights of her career is the research and teaching partnership nurtured with the Department of Social Work at the Dortmund University of Applied Sciences in Germany with Professor Michael Booker and Dr. Maud Mtembu at UKZN. One of the fruits of this partnership was the opportunity awarded to 12 students from UJ and UKZN who traveled to Germany on a student exchange program in December 2019. <laughs> Professor Ra Tanusha Raniga is a C2 NRF rated researcher and has supervised or examined about 65 honors, masters, and doctoral research projects. She has published 
40 articles in national and international accredited journals. She is chair of the board of the Southern African Journal for Social Work and Social Development. Professor Raniga is a co-editor of the book titled The Tensions Between Culture and Human Rights, Emancipatory Social Work and Afrocentricity in a Global World, published by the University of Calgary Press with two esteemed colleagues, Professor Vishanti Supal and Professor Linda Kretzer. In terms of leadership, Professor Raniga served as the treasurer of Asaswe for one term and the Association for Schools of Social Work in Africa for two terms. In terms of administration, she has served as the academic leader of social work at UKZN in the School of Applied Human Sciences from January 2014 to March 2017. She currently is the postgraduate coordinator in the Department of Social Work and Community Development at UJ. She would like to take this opportunity to thank all her colleagues in social work, past and present, from UKZN to UJ, for their support and friendship over the years. Professor Raniga is married to Dinesh, a compassionate pharmacist who selflessly serves his patients, and together they have raised two beautiful children, Yashil and Dia. After her family and quiet contemplation about the philosophy of life, Tanusha loves music, cooking, ice cream, and watching movies. <laughs> the Faculty of Humanities is immensely proud of Prof. Raniga, and we look forward to hearing her inaugural address. I thank you. <coughs> Good evening, and San Monain. Firstly, I would like to pay tribute to my late dad and sister for their wisdom and the life lessons they have left me. I want to thank my husband, Dinesh, for his unconditional support, my children, Yashil and Dia, who are present here and who are my constant pillar of strength, to my family who have joined virtually, and my mother in particular. Mom, you are my inspiration and you serve as an exemplary example of a woman's strength and resilience. I take this opportunity to acknowledge the Vice Chancellor, Professor Marwala, uh, Professor Mpedi, who is present here today, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Naidu, um, the HOD of Social Work and Community Development, and my dear colleague, Professor Van Breda, Professor Sue Paul, who has been my intellectual guru and my respondent this evening, and to my colleagues and students who have joined on this virtual platform, I truly appreciate you. As an academic, I've always embraced that there's a close connect between my research, community engagement, and my teaching functions. Over the years, my research agenda has focused primarily on the relationship between social protection policies, poverty alleviation in female-headed households, and sustainable livelihoods. There is growing empirical evidence that poverty is feminized, meaning that a huge proportion of the world's poor are women. The term feminization of poverty was first conceptualized in the late 70s in the United States when it was discovered that female-headed households were the fastest growing type of family structure. Almost four decades later, the issue of women's economic empowerment and gender equality remains a concern in South Africa, in Africa, and globally. In South Africa, gender-based inequalities and discrimination are, the, are very much apparent, although we must acknowledge foundational policies such as the White Paper on Social Welfare, the White Paper on Local Government, the Cooperatives Development Policy, and the National Development Plan, Vision 2030, which supports pro-poor and pro-economic growth objectives. While the rollout of these policies are commendable, my research over several years has shown that there are major gaps which translating these policy directives into meaningful action such as access to microcredit, collective organization, and business training for women. In 
International literature reveals that experiences of poverty are both quantitatively and qualitatively different for women as a result of systematic discrimination that women face with regard to access to education, health care, food security, access to land and employment in both the formal and the informal economy. In 2011, I conducted a qualitative study which captured the voices of 15 teenage mothers who resided in a predominantly impoverished community. The findings revealed that teenage mothers' childbearing experiences were not just private issues, but were profoundly linked to public issues such as structural poverty, economic exclusion, and low literacy levels due to little or no access to education. In 2014, I published an article based on research which qualitatively explored the economic experiences of 25 single mothers who embarked on individual livelihood activities as an attempt to break the cycle of poverty. The empirical evidence from the study showed that single mothers from low-income communities faced social and economic exclusion in the informal economy on the grounds of structural poverty as well as gender discrimination. Over the past five years, I have extended this research agenda to investigate the psychosocial, economic challenges and coping resources of single mothers employed in the formal work sector. The empirical evidence I present to you this evening has formed the focus of my research collaboration with Dortmund University in Germany and the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And my presentation is titled Economic Experiences and Sustainable Livelihoods of Single Mothers Employed in the Formal Work Sector in Germany and in South Africa. <clears throat> the state of African nation economies has long been a concern for social science scholars and social policy advocates. In the past two decades, the South African policy discourse has given attention to the contribution of women to the economy. It is widely acknowledged that women across many global South countries are unable to secure employment in the mainstream formal economy and end up in the informal economy out of necessity rather than choice. We are blatantly aware of the historical inequalities and structural disjuncture that exists in South Africa's economy. We must also take note that the benefits of accumulated investments generational family wealth and working in the first economy does not necessarily trickle down to benefit those who are poor and unemployed. <clears throat> With the deeper economic crisis experienced by nation states in both the global north and south countries, which has accelerated due to the onset of COVID-19, many have questioned the legitimacy of global capitalism and put in place social protection systems which would help the unemployed to sustain livelihoods. Evidence from several of my research studies also reveals that cooperative projects have unleashed the creative human capabilities and entrepreneurial skills of unemployed women who reside in low-income communities. I argue that the discourses on women's role in the informal economy cannot be perceived as a separate economic space structurally disconnected from the formal economy. At this point, I want to turn our attention to looking at single mothers and employment in Germany and in South Africa. So two historical events in Germany and South Africa serve as points of insight on single mother households in this presentation. In South Africa, the year 1994 marked a historical beginning of the post-apartheid era, while the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of West and East Germany in the context of broader European integration were similarly dramatic events for Germany. In 2017, Germany was ranked fourth in the international comparison, while South Africa was ranked 33rd according to the estimations of the International Monetary Fund. Even if a comparison of national economies solely based on GDP can be viewed critically, it nevertheless shows that economic prosperity 
significantly differs between both countries, with consequent challenges for women striving for economic independence and better access to jobs in the formal work sector. Empirical evidence reveals that the proportion of single parent households has increased in Europe and in Africa. This is of particular interest to social workers as single mother households have a much higher vulnerability to poverty, economic insecurity and <clears throat> psychosocial stresses compared to two parent households. An overview of international research on the economic experiences of single mothers reveals a multitude of distinct personal, social and political factors of influence that play a prominent role in their survival strategies. With rising poverty and inequality, there is much concern about where the public policies are focusing on changing dynamics of family structures and the well-being and sustainability of single mother households in particular. In Scandinavian countries such as Sweden, Denmark and Finland, no significant reduction in formal employment is evident among single mothers caring for children under the age of three. This was due to state legislation which facilitated maternity benefits, parental leave, support for childcare through tax policies and access to publicly subsidized childcare facilities. These are critical legislative and policy imperatives that South Africa can take heed of. One key factor of influence which is relevant to both South Africa and Germany regarding the evolution of the family is the increasing economic independence of women. According to the Federal Statistical Office in Germany, 23% of the total population comprises single parent households. In Germany, the number of single mothers working in the formal work sector has risen from 65% to 70% in the last decade. In 2018, the employment rate of single mothers in the formal work sector in Germany was 3% higher than that of women in couple households. <clears throat> studies, comparative studies of various European welfare states uh, reveal that single mother family status, status is uh, related to the interplay between inadequate resources, poor access to job opportunities and inadequate policies to support domestic and child care responsibilities. Single mothers often experience economic insecurity through structural and wage inequality, precarious low paid job, uh, jobs and political as well as social stigma. In South Africa, the trend of increased social single mother households in the past decade, which is concentrated mainly in urban areas, is similar to that of Germany. In a qualitative study that I conducted with Dr. Mtembu in 2017, we concluded that some of the key factors for increased single mother households is accelerated urbanization, economic globalization, and fluid inter-province and inter-country migration. This trend can also be observed in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Zambia, where the number of single mother households has increased due to structural poverty, unequal opportunities in the labor market, and increased mortality of biological fathers. <clears throat> Previous research on single mother family status um, really focused on a distinctive pathological um, narrative. Single mother families challenge the dominant paradigm of heteronormativity found within the notion of traditional nuclear family households. So this presentation seeks to disrupt the dominant discourse of victimhood related to single mother family status. I'd like to now turn to give you some insight into the relevance of the sustainable livelihood approach, which served as a conceptual foundation for my study. I argue that the sustainable livelihood approach provides a valuable organizing framework for social workers seeking to reduce vulnerability of poverty and economic insecurity in single mother households. I draw on writers such as Cressman and McKnight, 
who discussed the integration of five major assets necessary to sustain livelihoods in households. And these include human capital, social capital, physical capital, financial capital, and natural capital. So I like what Professor Lombard argues, that developmental social work and the sustainable livelihood approach are in principle decolonial, as both theories are based on the principles of people-centeredness, social justice, and human rights. Professor Nell argues that households adjust to their physical, social, economic, and natural environments through a focus on these livelihood capitals designed to protect the household from shocks during times of crisis, such as the adjustment from a two-parent income household to a single income household. I want to now give you some insight into the uh, bi bi biographic profile of the participants in my study. So the majority of the women were of a mature age, as they were 40 years and above. 24 of the mothers had completed an undergraduate degree. 21 of the women confirmed that they were the sole income earners in their fa families, while four had adult children who were contributing to the income in the household. All the single mothers were heads of their households and were responsible for an average of two dependents. So the first theme that emerged from my study was positive human skills development. 20, 20 of the 25 women had a tertiary qualification which enabled them access to well-paying jobs in the formal work sector. All the women stated that the choice to invest in their education helped to enhance their self-confidence and their human capabilities. The majority of previous research in South Africa and Germany has largely focused on social protection policy measures that were implemented to facil facilitate cash transfers to single mothers. However, the limitation was that the menial income it received from the state support grant in South Africa <clears throat> placed severe restrictions upon single mothers who wanted to pursue post-secondary education. In this particular study, the woman noted that postgraduate qualifications were perceived by the line managers as an imperative for upward mobility and the, the women felt that their decisions to pursue further education had improved their human capital development. Hence, it was not surprising that 80% of the single mothers had secured well-paying jobs in either government, the private sector and higher education institutions. In both Germany and South Africa, there's much empirical evidence to support the claim that obtaining a base degree and making a life choice to pursue postgraduate qualification results in higher income, in sec income security for women and for single mothers in particular. <clears throat> a finding worth noting was that five of the South African single mothers had opted to leave their well-paying jobs in the private sector to work as freelance consultants in the fields of art, social welfare and health. These women stated that the primary reason for this life choice was to have a better balance of their work and childcare responsibilities. One mother said, I have the flexibility to attend school activities and be there for my kids. I'm able to balance my mother and work responsibilities better. These human capital benefits had a positive impact on their children's education as all of these self-employed women had stated that they were able to send their children to private schools and give them much needed attention um, with their academic tasks. You can focus on some of the voices of the women that I've included in this slide. So all the women were proud to be single mothers because it gave them the liberty to live life on their own terms. They were the sole decision makers and were able to raise their children with their own values. However, the participants also acknowledged with disappointment that the key barrier associated with single mother family status is social stigma. 
Along these lines, all of the single mothers in Germany and seven of the women from South Africa stated that they struggled with, with mental health and psychosocial stresses such as depression, burnout, loneliness and isolation. Those single mothers who were working full time had to count on the support from domestic helpers, friends and extended family members for childcare support. And I now turn to the second theme that emerged from the data, which is building social networks. Empirical studies have sufficiently proven that social capital and support networks have a significant influence on the life situation and coping strategies of single mothers. All the women stated that they could count on support from their parents, friends and other mothers in the community. Five of the South African single mothers who were self-employed stated that they could count on domestic helpers who played the role of nannies when they had to work late. What was interesting was that the women from Germany primarily drew on social networks from their nuclear family members, while the participants from South Africa drew on support from extended family members and friends. A key aspect of building social networks and social capital for all of the women was the connections and the social networks created through their work environments. And I share some of the sentiments that the women um, had stated in my study. So 13 of the South African single mothers in the sample spoke about the ability of other single mothers at work who helped them pool their strengths, identify opportunities for support, uh, and motherhood activities, and they built social networks within the school environment that often significantly uh, signaled the difference between psychosocial stresses and greater home and work balance and household stability. These women also acknowledged the immense support and care that older women, such as grandmothers, older siblings and aunts, who were either living with them in the household and had played a, a major role in caring for minor children. These single mothers were able to work flexi hours without the stress of childcare responsibilities. And that these experiences often provided the motivation for single mothers to share their life experiences and offer non-judgmental support to other single mothers in the community. I want to turn now to the 13th theme that emerged from the data, which is tapping on multiple streams of income. 12 of the single mothers in South Africa and four of the German women shared that they struggled financially to meet their household expenses every month. <clears throat> and you would see some of the quotes that I've included in the slide. What was clear, clear in the interviews was that despite their financial struggles, all of the women had made conscious decisions uh, to strive to become economically self-reliant. They admitted that in the beginning it was not easy to adjust to one salary to sustain the expenses in their households. It's clear from the comments that they were determined to move beyond the victimhood mentality and strive to meet their monthly household expenses through tapping on multiple streams of income for enhanced economic security. These included contract work outside of the formal work sector uh, or working overtime at their respective place of employment. 22 of the women revealed that they received a maintenance payment from the biological fathers of their children. Um, but they were also of the view that this income was menial to meet the material needs of their children. It was commendable that all the self-employed single mothers mentioned that they did not struggle financially and that through their multiple work contracts, they were uh, able to generate sufficient income to meet their monthly household expenses. They no longer perceive themselves as victims of externally controlled structures and circumstances, rather as agents of change, both for their own lives as well as the lives of their children. So one mother commented, I don't become a victim. They, this is a liberating space for me and that the difficult times made me stronger. <clears throat> so some of the conclusions from this study and my previous research with single mothers in low income communities um, reveal that single mothers are not a homogeneous group. 
as variables such as age, education level and employment status have a profound impact on the private experiences of women, their life choices and coping resources. The complexity of challenges experienced by single mothers is elusive given the multicultural, multiracial, fluid and changing, transforming society. Confronting structural systems of influence in workspaces are key to understanding and undoing gender oppression. The challenges facing single mother households cannot effectively be solved by the state, civil society organizations and or the private sector alone. The role of single mothers has evolved before, beyond victimhood to include a new narrative which is pivotal to maintain critical household sustainability. It's imperative for social workers to advocate to transform institutional and structural conditions in both the formal and informal economy to facilitate greater gender equality in workspaces. Transformative interventions must include implementing therapeutic support groups with single mothers to help them to deal with mental health and social stresses, to enhance support networks and to invest in human capability. It is important to include social entrepreneurship training with single mothers to enhance economic security and reduce vulnerability to poverty. It is imperative that policymakers social workers and gender activists lobby for access to microcredit and loans for single mothers. Advocating for social protection policies that strengthen women's agency by connecting with their aspirations that facilitate support for their livelihood activities within an enabling policy environment is necessary. And finally, I propose that integrating the sustainable livelihood approach in trans transformative interventions is important in practice in order to improve the economic security of single mother households. Thank you so much for listening to me. Friends and uh, colleagues, it is a pleasure to be part of Thanusha Reniga's special event. Congratulations, Thanusha. Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese-American writer and poet, says this of parents and children. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite and he bends you with his might, and his arrows might go swift and far. Like parents, educators give their students wings to fly. And if we are good educators, our students will surpass us, for their arrow does indeed go further than the bow. I have known Professor Thanusha Raniga. It is so good to be able to use that title for the past two decades and have traveled the journeys with her as she's transitioned from student to emerging academic and now coming fully unto her own to belong to that rank of a selected and esteemed few. Professor Oniga representing an applied professional discipline is no ivory tower academic. Informed by critical social research, she has always engaged in research for the purposes of social change and development. Her, committed, her commitment to social justice has manifested in participatory research approaches with communities, with her strength being her ability to bring together community engagement, research and teaching. And she has also done a great deal for professional development initiatives. While broad notions of social and economic justice have always been her concern, as you've heard her speak this evening, it is gender justice that remains her passion. Professor Oniga rightfully warns us that we must not essentialize the experiences of all single mothers and pathologize them that social criteria such as age, 
level of education, opportunities for gainful employment, strong social networks, and the agency that women experience are all factors that contribute to success. Single motherhood is a space of pride and liberation, or can be a space of pride and liberation, as the narratives of middle-class women across Germany and South Africa reflect in Professor Reniga's collaborative international research. But these spaces of pride and liberation occur within the infrapolitics of power and structural conditions that enable these. Unfortunately, not all single mothers enjoy the same space. Across the globe, macro-level data informs us about the feminization of poverty, which certainly has implications for family and child well-being and intergenerational cycles of poverty. These are the focus of much of Professor Raniga's research, particularly in informal communities. In these, she has highlighted the systematic discrimination that women face with regard to access to education, healthcare, food security, to land and to employment. And of course, we have the systematic attack on women's bodies with domestic violence, sexual harassment and rape. Discrimination against women reflects the interconnectedness between neoliberal capitalism and the culture of patriarchy. Women's status and gendered oppression must be conceptualized as both reproductive and productive. Women are controlled by a patriarchal system within the family and household by men and within the economic system. Workers, both men and women, are controlled by capitalist elites, wherein women's oppression retains male privilege and power and the power of capital. Religion, culture, and sociopolitical and economic circumstances coalesce in powerful ways to violate the rights of people, particularly those of women and girls. In the text that Professor Oniga co-edited with me, and a Canadian colleague, Linda Kreitzel, we concluded that it is difficult to separate the effects of cultural ideological constraints. For example, the claims to a primordial essence, socioeconomic deprivation, and the consumerist ideology engendered by neoliberalism, as each overlaps and constrains the other. Unfortunately, awareness of gender injustice does not always translate into social change initiatives. So we need to challenge the notion that information deters stereotypes. So normalized and naturalized are the ideologies, the taken for granted assumptions underpinning gender and race stereotyping, oppression and privilege, that Stuart Hall asked the following. A critical question in developed liber liberal democracies is precisely how ideology is reproduced in the so-called private institutions of civil society, the theater of consent, apparently outside the direct sphere of the play of the state. How a society allows the relative freedom of civil institutions to operate in the ideological field day after day without direction or compulsion by the state. Men and women often invoke the need to maintain harmony as a major reason for the retention of gendered roles, which they see as God-given. People do attach to biological manifestations of race and gender, social descriptors and cultural extensions that have become to be widely accepted and naturalized. We are all products and producers of our socio-political and cultural worlds, and we often reproduce gender stereotypes and human rights violations, often justified with a very popular refrain, it's in our culture. The ideologies that we hold are reflected in 
and reinforced by activities in the home and the school, in our temples, churches, mosques, ashrams, and synagogues, in politics and the social structures around us, reflecting a circular and dialectical relationship between structure and agency. The systems, laws, and policies out there that we often criticize are representations of the collectivities of the consciousness of all of us. We are, are all complicit. As much as deeply entrenched in inscriptions of racism, casteism, and classism need to be challenged and changed at multi-systemic levels, so do gender inscriptions. While there is no guarantee that people will take the leap from heightened critical consciousness to social action and transformation, confronting the influence of external systems on our thinking and engaging in ideological critique are the first steps to understanding and undoing oppression and privilege. Such deconstruction must be followed by reconstruction and supportive engagement of people in constructive change efforts. As Professor Raniga's work shows us, these issues are of deep concern for the social work profession. Emancipatory social work is directed at heightening awareness of external sources of oppression and or privilege that hold the possibility of increasing people's self-esteem, courage and conviction so that they themselves begin to confront structural sources of poverty, inequality, marginalization, oppression, and exclusion. It is an approach that says that we can be the authors and editors of our own lives. But for this to happen, knowledge must go beyond information dissemination to include the self as a site of politicization a politicization that must be directed towards reflexivity and transforming common sense taken for granted assumptions into what Gramsci called good sense, that is empirically tested common sense. Critically reflective social dialogue can go a long way in helping people shift from what Alzheimer's called the subjected being to being the free subject who is the author of and responsible for its actions. We must ask, of what benefit is it to claim our freedom of speech when we have lost our freedom to think? Professor Roniga's research informs us that the choices are not either or. She reminds us of the heterogeneity of women's experiences, alerts us to understanding women, but particularly single mothers in non-pathologizing and non-judgmental ways and to the structural impacts on women's lives. She rightfully underscores the importance of the validation of women, of the need for social protection measures and of economic and social empowerment of women. Professor Reniga, you have earned your title. Continue to grow equally both in stature and humility. Use your title well with loving kindness, understanding, and compassion. For these are gifts to yourself, your family, your students, and the communities that you engage with. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Sipol. Ladies and gentlemen, earlier I talked about Ingubo, and uh, the moment has come. Of course, in our context, Ingubo would mean um, an academic rope and a cap, and the time has come for Professor uh, um, Raniga to be roped. And uh, for that, I would like to, for that purpose, I'd like to invite our executive dean, Professor Naidu, to rope uh, Professor Raniga.
Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to use this opportunity and congratulate uh, Professor Raniga. Thank you. Well done, colleague. Professor Raniga, thank you very much for um, you know an interesting uh, inaugural address. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, professors profess, and I'm sure that you'll agree with me that Professor Raniga professed this evening. And it's not about me, but I must say um, your inaugural lecture, Professor Raniga, uh, reminded me of my own mother, um, who raised me, uh, my younger brother and sisters, as a single uh, a woman, uh, a widow at a young age, and raised us to be people we are today. So. Um, your, your, your inaugural address wasn't only intellectually stimulating, but it also touched me uh, personally. And um, we really need to do more, especially from a social protection point of view, and, and also you know equality and all that for our single mothers. But this is not about me, as I've said. Another thing, it reminded me, if you allow me, of a silly idea that I had with my, my friend when we were about to graduate with our our um, our first degrees, naive in our early 20s, and we thought before we kneel before the chancellor, we will whisper to him and say it was not easy. And now looking back, um, there was nothing compared to the journey of becoming a full professor, and I'm sure Professor Raniga will, will agree with me that it was not an easy journey. It's a journey of sacrifice, hard work, sleepless nights, and, and, and um, sometimes neglecting the family, unfortunately. It shouldn't be like that, but sometimes it's something that has to be, uh, to be done to go through your research, to tweak you know, your research, and so on. And for that, I would like to thank your family. I know they have suffered, they have paid uh, with you know, time and everything for you to be here. And I wanna thank them for the support that they gave you in your journey to be here. And um, I also want to take this opportunity and thank our respondent uh, this evening, Professor Supal. Prof, thank you very much. This kind, yes, we shouldn't be shy, we should clap for uh, <laughs> Professor Supal. This kind of um, achievements are not easy, as I've said. Another point that I should mention is that you need supportive leaders to achieve this. Without supportive leaders, you'll end up being frustrated and quit the academy. And for that, I would like to thank the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Naidu, for the support and leadership that is provided, that today we can see the fruit of your leadership, Prof, in Professor Raniga coming forward and being inaugurated. Thank you very much, Prof. I also wish to take this opportunity and thank um, um, our audience this, uh, this, this evening in this uh, chamber, but also on Facebook and on uh, YouTube for joining us. It means a lot to us. Thank you very much. Um, last but not least, I want to say these events do not organize themselves. Always there are people who work behind the scene that make this thing, uh, these events or events like this possible. And I would like to thank all of you, those who are present here uh, in this chamber tonight, and those who may not be here but watching from wherever they are, thank you very much uh, for your dedication and for ensuring that we could uh, stream this live to um, our audience, our stakeholders, our friends and family members from wherever they are. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the inaugural uh, lecture of uh, Professor Raniga. Um, I would like to say to our audience at home who are watching on YouTube, on Facebook, that we don't take your support lightly as the University of Johannesburg. We really appreciate that. And uh, we hope to welcome you again virtually, of course, at uh, many of our future events. Thank you very much. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. The University of Johannesburg. The future reimagined.